What if I told you that there is a web application vulnerability so simple to exploit that it could make bug hunting feel like a breeze? In this video, I will reveal this vulnerability type to you and I will share 7 techniques and concepts that most bug bounty hunters are unaware of. You can easily apply these techniques to your bug bounty hunting and hopefully score some juicy bounties. But that is not all. At the end of this video, I will show you how you get free access to a cheat sheet containing everything discussed in this video. But first, let me show you a bug bounty report demonstrating how effective this bug class is. Back in 2021, a bug hunter earned a bounty of $49,500 from Facebook from the bug class we are going to discuss today. Back then, a bug hunter started exploring the functionalities of Instagram Reels. He discovered the following endpoint. Here, Clips Media ID refers to the ID of the reel, and Upload ID is the ID of the new thumbnail photo to be used. By modifying the Clips Media ID to another reel's ID, the researcher was able to replace thumbnails on reels of other users. The implications were huge. By just knowing a reel's media ID, an attacker could change the reel's thumbnail. Let's illustrate this vulnerability type in a simple real-world example. Imagine you're on your company's internal site and the URL reads. This will display your salary information. What do you think happens if we change that number ID at the end of the URL? With just a minor tweak, suddenly you're looking at someone else's salary details. No passwords were asked and no permissions were checked. You've just bypassed a serious access control issue with a simple change. This is a classic example of an IDOR. Insecure Direct Object Reference, or IDOR, is a type of access control vulnerability that arises when an application uses user-supplied input to access objects directly. The impact of this simple vulnerability type can be massive. From personal data leaks to unauthorized data manipulation, the consequences can affect millions of users. Now, let's dive into the practical side of things. I will show you 7 techniques on how to hunt for IDOs. First, let's talk about the most critical part, knowing what to look for. The parameters in a URL or API request can often give away potential vulnerabilities. Here are the top parameters you should look out for when hunting for IDOs. Don't worry about jotting these down. Everything we cover will be provided in the free cheat sheet at the end of this video. Let's get directly into the next tip. What do you think this string is? It is a UUID, a universally unique identifier. While hunting for IDOs, you will often encounter UUIDs. They are designed to be non-guessable, which might seem to shut down avenues for exploitation. Many bug bounty programs do not consider IDOs on UUIDs as a vulnerability. But don't be deterred, here are a few tricks to test these seemingly secure IDs. First, look for leaks. UUIDs can sometimes be exposed in other parts of the application. Check logs, error messages, and the page source. Next, don't assume all UUIDs are created perfectly. Test if they are truly non-guessable. Sometimes, developers implement custom UUID generation methods that may not be as random as expected. You can also try simpler UUIDs. Replace a complex UUID with basic numeric sequences or predictable patterns. You'd be surprised how often the default values are overlooked in access controls. Finally, dig in the archives. Utilize tools like the Wayback Machine or Common Crawl. These archives might hold versions of the application where UUIDs were exposed, which you can utilize. Moving on to our next tip, consider this common request. If you can't find an IDOR on the user ID parameter, try to add another user ID into the mix like this. This technique is called parameter pollution. Another variation involves lists. Here you switch it up to. This format suggests an array. And if the backend is not strictly validating the input type, you might just gain access to multiple users' data. Another useful tip in your IDOR hunting toolkit is to test all HTTP methods. While GET and POST are the most common, neglecting PUT, PATCH and DELETE could mean missing out on critical vulnerabilities. Let's recap the first four techniques we have discussed so far. 
the most common IDOR parameters, UUIDs, parameter pollution, and the usage of different HTTP methods. Let's continue with the remaining three techniques. Imagine you come across a URL parameter like this. The file ID string looks like it's encoded. Specifically, this could be base64. Decoding it reveals the plain text. Now, we can modify the file name and then re-encode it to base64. Substituting the original encoded string with this new one in the URL could allow access to a different file. The parameter might be encoded with a more sophisticated scheme than simple base64, or it might be hashed. In this case, you can try tools like Cyberchef or Hashes.com. For our next tip, let's say you identified the following endpoint. Sometimes fuzzing can expose overlooked endpoints and potential security flaws. In this case, there are two main opportunities for fuzzing here. First, you can fuzz the version number. The second fuzzing point is right after view. Here, appending different terms can reveal hidden or undocumented endpoints. Not every endpoint will blatantly show an ID parameter, but that doesn't mean it's secure from IDOR vulnerabilities. If you're working with an endpoint that does not have any parameter, start testing by appending potential ID parameters. The second technique involves replacing generic terms with specific IDs. Often, endpoints use placeholders like self or user to refer to the current session's user. We have now looked at three additional techniques to identify IDOR vulnerabilities, namely, how to handle encoded or hashed IDs, how to fuzz endpoints for IDORs, and what to do when no ID is present in the URL. And since you are still watching, let me add a bonus tip on top. IDORs can sometimes be combined with cross-site scripting. Specifically, when you combine IDOR with self-XSS, you can often create a stored XSS targeted towards a specific user. Consider a scenario where you can create a folder via an API. The impact of a self-XSS in the folder name would be rather limited, since you can only expose yourself to it. However, if there is also an IDOR vulnerability in the user ID parameter, such that you can create folders for different users, you can chain these two vulnerabilities. In this case, you would be able to store malicious scripts directly in the workspace of other users. When this user accesses his workspace, the XSS triggers. Through chaining these two vulnerabilities, the impact got significantly increased. But if you don't understand cross-site scripting, everything I have just told you is completely useless. Therefore, please click the video on the screen where I detail everything you need to know about cross-site scripting. Also check out the link in the description to the iDoor cheat sheet, where I collected all the information from this video completely for free. That's it for today. Thanks for watching and don't forget, stay curious and happy hacking.